Mods, the unofficial changes or additions to video games. Should a developer support them or shut them down? On Friday, the 16th of August, the incredible H2M mod for Modern Warfare Remastered was supposed to be released. But with only 24 hours to go, the team behind it were hit with a cease and desist from Activision, putting an immediate stop to the project. Activision aren't exactly known for embracing mods, but the circumstances around this one in particular seem interesting. Modern Warfare Remastered came out in 2016, eight years ago at this point, and was initially bundled with Infinite Warfare, meaning most people didn't actually play this game at all, and had one of the worst launches of any Call of Duty game. Eventually, Activision listed the game for sale individually, which helped slightly, but the murky launch, alongside the early days of the Universal Windows platform, it didn't go too well. Eventually, the game was also listed on Steam, reaching an all-time peak of only 6,000 players, before quickly plummeting down into the hundreds. However, with the news of the upcoming H2M release, the game's sales started to rocket up the charts, reaching number 3 on Steam's overall charts, only behind Counter-Strike and the Steam Deck. This was also helped by the conveniently timed sale for Modern Warfare Remastered, which was 50% off its questionably high price tag. This sale would end on Thursday the 15th of August, just one day before the mod was supposed to drop. So what exactly was H2M? It was a mod for Modern Warfare Remastered that added content from Modern Warfare 2, including the maps, guns, perks, and some brand new content the team developed to create a single modern title that contains all of the classic content that the Modern Warfare series was known for back in the day. The project was going to feature the full 70 ranks, 10 prestiges that we used to know, and was on track to be one of the most popular mods in Call of Duty history. This project has been in development for years, and the team have been public since July of last year, so Activision will have been made aware of this at some point since then, but they held off the cease and desist. I understand that Activision don't generally allow these kinds of things, and sending a cease and desist is completely within their rights. But the fact that they chose to put the game on sale, wait until everyone had bought it in anticipation for the release of H2M, right before pulling the plug on the project, is a very concerning issue that people have pointed out. It's not illegal to do so, it's quite the opposite. But the public opinion and PR disaster that it causes can affect the studio way more than just shutting down projects as they pop up. So why would a studio allow games to be modified in the first place if it's infringing on their IP? Well, it's because it's really beneficial for a studio to have a dedicated community surrounding a game, and Activision knows this, because in the past they have offered mod tools to a resounding success. Call of Duty World at War was the introduction for zombies, and while the main experience was focused on those four iconic maps, the PC community experienced something different. Alongside the game, you could download the mod making tools provided by Treyarch to create custom maps for zombies. As the tools were readily available, community members began toying around with new ideas for maps, bringing a whole new layer of content to the game. And this freedom to create all sorts of new maps allowed for a variety of experiences. Some maps were faithful recreations of well-known places like SpongeBob's house, some were weird challenge maps or one barriers that were just designed for fun, but a handful of mod makers took it upon themselves to create maps that would rival Treyarch's own in quality. But what does this mean for Treyarch and Activision? Why support this in the first place? Well, that's easy. You need to own the game to play the mods. It's another factor that drives sales, which means that as long as the mod makers are acting responsibly, everyone wins. And Treyarch, being the community-focused COD studio, released mod tools again with Black Ops 3, which once again opened the door for custom zombies maps. World at War was the introduction of the game mode, but by Black Ops 3, we knew what worked for a zombies game, and the community pushed the mod tools to the absolute limit. The game was bigger and better looking than World at War, and it showed with the level of quality that each map came with, with people still to this day developing and supporting Black Ops 3's custom scene, it's quite clear that by including mod tools for a game, can be extremely beneficial to the game's life cycle. But because of this, I do sort of understand why Activision don't want that. Call of Duty is a yearly release. It's absolutely littered with microtransactions, but these studios still need the newest game to sell extremely well. And if you give players enough reasons to stay, they're much less likely to buy the new one, ultimately harming the studio. So how do they balance this? 
Call of Duty makes a ridiculous amount of money from weapon skins and operators. From Rhea Ripley to the Terminator, there's so many crossover brands in the game nowadays and they all cost a hefty amount to purchase. So if they were to allow these to be added by mods, that would cut off a revenue stream. But maps don't cost money anymore. They haven't charged for a map pack in years, so they could be fair game. Allow the creation of custom maps for zombies or multiplayer that the players can use with their purchased skins. I know I would be more likely to put money into a game if I knew the game wasn't likely to die off as soon as the next one comes along. Now, let's move away from the Call of Duty series with a history lesson on why mods need to be supported and how they are the foundation of gaming today. Quake was an iconic shooter back in the day, paving the way for modern FPS games. And in fact, the engine Quake was made in was the foundation to the Gold Source engine, which powered a little game called Half-Life. Valve, a brand new company at the time, reached out to id to license their engine and with that as a starting point they created half-life the engine itself was a mod and while it went on and evolved to become their own they still needed that starting point but that's not all because half-life funnily enough went on to become an extremely moddable game the more open nature of the engine lent itself nicely to creative community members and plenty of mods spawned from half-life the first one is probably the most famous mod of all time counter-strike it's impossible to think of Valve or competitive shooters without thinking of CS. And it all started with Min Lee and Jess Cliff creating a multiplayer mod for Half-Life. With its unique shooting style and competitive focus, it quickly became a success. So much so that Valve hired them to work on an official release and in 2000, CS was an official Valve title. It then went on to spawn multiple entries with the latest one being CS2 released late last year. But this isn't the only case of this happening. Valve's other major multiplayer series, Team Fortress, started his life as a Quake mod. Funny how that works. Even in their infancy, Valve were embracing the modding scene and would happily work with enthusiastic developers as opposed to shutting them down in an attempt to protect their IPs. Day of Defeat, Natural Selection, Chivalry Medieval Warfare, Dear Esther, Gary's Mod, Insurgency, The Stanley Parable, Dino D-Day, Fistful of Frags. These are all games that started as mods built for Half-Life or Half-Life 2 and ended up becoming standalone games that found success on their own. The fact that Valve embraced modding and even built the Steam Workshop to make it even easier to support the creators has positively impacted the industry in such a way that without it, these games just wouldn't be the same. Another company that have learned to embrace the modding community is Bethesda. However, they've done it in a slightly different way. Fallout and Skyrim are two of the most modded games around, and Bethesda are more than happy to accommodate for this. Fallout 3 and New Vegas are both supported by the Garden of Eden creation kit, a mod tool used to design new locations, quests and items, and a reference to the in-world Gek, a tool used to improve the wasteland for survivors. This led to a massive amount of content for the games, with Nexus mods currently hosting around 50,000 mods for the two games, with over 800 million downloads between them. These vary massively from new weapon packs, storylines, or <clears throat> those kinds of mods. Skyrim has the same treatment, and with over 7 billion combined downloads, it's no wonder that game has been re-released about 10 times. When Fallout 4 came along, Bethesda knew that they had to support it, so once again released a creation kit for the community. But wanting to get in on the financial side of it, introduced the Fallout Creation Club. This all came with a lot of controversy, but crucially, it didn't remove the free market of mods available elsewhere, like Nexus, so ultimately it wasn't too big of a deal. How this works is notable mod authors who were approached by Bethesda to create content could have their mods available to purchase in-game, with the use of creation credits, which are just a standard microtransaction currency. The conversion rate of these credits is about a thousand for ten dollars, which doesn't get you a whole lot from the catalog. Each weapon or apparel set costs around four or five hundred credits, so you're spending quite a lot on just a single gun. I've played Fallout 4 many times, and I've never even checked the creation club, but I have played with a few mods from Nexus, so that should give you some idea of the value of the creation club. However, it is nice to know that modders were being paid for their work, 
even if that does come with quite a few asterisks. Alongside the TV show's massive success, Fallout's interest saw another spike with the massive hype surrounding the release of Fallout London, a completely unique original gameplay experience created by Team Folan, great name, to bring the post-apocalyptic wastelands to London. So basically just an accurate representation of the city. It's probably one of the most ambitious mods ever created with a team of 12 behind it alongside others for things like voice acting and testing. What started as a small questline mod back in 2019, the team turned it into a full game experience, playing around with the Fallout elements in a new location with its own unique quirks. Stay safe and remember, mind the gap. Allowing the creation of mods for games is important, as it allows the community to be creative, demonstrate new ideas for the game, and maybe even bring to life the basis for a brand new title. It's also a great way for those mod developers to get recognition from the larger studios to potentially help their careers grow. It's always nice to see companies that support their communities knowing that the communities will support them back. But what are your thoughts? Do you use any mods in games, or are you a gaming purist? Let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.